Hello, welcome to Spirit of Life. My name is Geraldine Lee, your host, and our guest is Jean Sia. She spoke last week and will be speaking again. Welcome back. Thank you. Jean, you shared uh, so inspiringly about your story. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to go deeper into your faith story of how you actually came to experience um, God in your life and had that great experience for those viewers who haven't heard you last week. Well, I've been a cradle Catholic and I've been blessed with a lot of good Catholic education from kindergarten to university. Mm -hmm. So you can say I've always been experiencing God's presence in my life from my earliest days. And you, it's funny, but at the most Catholic um, part of my education, you could say, um, that was when I went through the dark night of the soul, as St. John mm -hmm. of the Cross speaks oh, of. Wow. He says that I think he says every Christian goes through this dark night of suffering, which is the Good Friday before Easter Sunday, and that uh -huh. is where God comes closest to us when we can't feel Him. Ah. Yeah, Con when you don't have consolations is when you're closest to God. Oh, right. I always thought that only the great saints went through the dark night of the soul, but you're saying that people actually come back to their faith through the dark night of the soul? Or their faith is strengthened. Ah, so that's been yeah, your experience. through suffering. So tell me about that time. What were you going through that led you to have that dark night of the soul? Um, well, I tend to not have what psychologists might call healthy boundaries. So I tend to help a lot of people. Uh -huh. And then... Like I just overstretched myself, and so I went into this spiral of uh, everyone's using me. Where mm. is God? Yes, <laughs> I feel mistreated because I got verbally abused by someone I was helping, and but then in the end, my friend said to me, "Sometimes we give our blood to other people when we should be giving Christ's blood to other people, ah. and that's where we get drained. So you need to keep going back to God to feel." to like fill yourself up again. Your lamp needs to be lighted with, oh. by the light of Christ. Yes, yeah. um, that's, that's a beautiful experience. And I suppose for those viewers who, who don't know about how the significance of the blood of Jesus meaning saving us and all this, maybe you can explain a bit more about the blood of yes. Christ. Well, in Catholic theology, um, like it's really bodily as well as spiritual mm -hmm. so you notice how in the scriptures Jesus doesn't just heal the blind man by saying so or by thinking it even though he can because he's God but he made creation like everything he made is good so he make, goes to the trouble of spitting on the mud I mean on the soil to make it mud and rubbing it on the man's eyes because mm -hmm. God reaches us through touch and so it's the same with the freshest blood of Christ um, in the mass in the Holy Eucharist which is the highest form of prayer and worship that we have because it is Christ's prayer to the Father. It's not our prayer. Uh, we'll, we join our prayers to Christ. I see. But He perfects it because He alone can make the perfect sacrifice and offering to God because mm. He is God. And um, yeah, we actually partake of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And I know it sounds really creepy for those who aren't <laughs> Catholic. Like back in Roman times, the Romans persecuted the Catholics because they thought we were cannibals ah. and vampires or whatever. But if you really understand the theology behind it, it's not like piece of dead flesh or someone's dried blood. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really a beautiful thing. You receive God completely, you unite yourself with Him because it's not just body and blood. It's body, blood, soul and divinity of Christ in this sacramental presence, which is the complete presence of God entering you and making yourself one with Him. Wow. Yeah I, I, yeah, I don't fully understand it, but I know when I was younger, I had went through depression. And when I went to daily Mass and yes. received the Eucharist, I just felt stronger. I couldn't put my finger on it. Yeah. Well, St. Augustine of Hippo says that when we receive the body of Christ worthily, we become what we receive. Mm. And it incorporates us into the mystical body of Christ, which is the Church. And as St. Joan of Arc said when, during her trial when she was, before she was put to death, she said, that Jesus Christ and the church are one. Wow. I I need to go back to daily mass now. Yes. You've inspired <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. So with that um 
with that whole experience of faith, um, do you now you know feel stronger in your faith? Would you say you've grown a lot? So you did theology and mm -hmm. you've studied. Yes. Yeah, so where is your journey now in faith? Well, I believe I've been really fortified intellectually by my education, but there's always the human dimension. Like, faith is not just about thinking, it's about being. Mm. And so um, I've been blessed by having good friends who have supported me, and through them, it's how I encounter Christ, like through the sacraments and through people. Wow, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is your calling in life? Oh, well, I used to have this idea that my calling, I have to pick one, I have to like be a nun or get married or maybe be single and serve the church or like it was just one or the other. But then now I've realized that it's just where you are. You are called to serve God. And I've got this beautiful quote about this 24-year-old Italian saint, Pier Giorgio Fasali. Um, he was just an ordinary guy. He liked climbing mountains and that's how he ministered to his friends. He just would go mountain climbing with them and then they'd go for adoration and mass. And he said, well, this person said, Pier Giorgio Frassati had a vocation. He was not a priest. He was not a religious. He was not married. When he was baptized, he was called and gifted. And him, he himself said, the faith given to me in baptism suggests to me surely by yourself, you will do nothing. But if you have God as the center of all your action, then you will reach the goal. Wow, that's beautiful. That's so inspiring because um, I'm involved in a singles ministry and, and often people say, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. What am I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're just who God like, has created you to be. And I think like, oh, there's this really good quote from another saint from Canada. Her name is Catherine Doherty and she also set up a ministry for people. Yep. Start with that, but we may have to, I may have to interrupt you, but start and then we'll continue. Keep, sure. keep going. She said, the duty of the moment is what you should be doing at any given time in whatever place God has put you. You may not have Christ in a homeless person at your door, but you may have a little child. If you have a child, your duty of the moment may be to change a dirty diaper. So you do it. But you don't just change that diaper, you change it to the best of your ability with great love for both God and that child. In that moment, I do need to stop you. Thank you. You've been watching Spirit of Life. Stay with us and we'll be back after the break. Hello, welcome back to Spirit of Life. My name is Geraldine Lee, your host, and our guest is Jean Sia. She's been sharing about her faith story. Jean, um, you were going to share that quote. Could you start again? Because I think, it's that, I think that was really important. Okay. Servant of God, Catherine Doherty said, The duty of the moment is what you should be doing at any given time, in whatever place God has put you. You may not have Christ in a homeless person at your door, but you may have a little child. If you have a child, your duty of the moment may be to change a dirty diaper. So you do it, but you don't just change that diaper. You change it to the best of your ability with great love for both God and that child. There are all kinds of good Catholic things you can do, but whatever they are, you have to realize that there's always the duty of the moment to be done. And it must be done because the duty of the moment is the duty of God. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I know another movement in the church called the Focalare movement, and they always have this quote of loving the present moment, and that really coincides with that. Yes. And it would help with, um, um, with people living and loving the present moment because everyone seems to have agendas these days and are rushing off here. Yes. They say that there's a religion of busyness at, oh, yes. <laughs> at this time. Mm -hmm. So tell us more, and is there anything more about your calling that you feel that, um, that, that has inspired you? Do you intend to, um, what job do you intend to have? Would you like to work in journalism Catholic or something? Media. Oh, yeah, I've that's applied for a Catholic media job. And um, I think it's where God is calling me to use my talents because I have a real passion for sharing the faith through that manner. Mm. Yes, and in what areas of the media do you hope to get involved with? Um, well, social media is a big thing and 
that's how I've realized that we can reach people who might not usually hear about the faith. Like I run this Tumblr blog called Signum Crucis, which is the sign of the cross. Mm. And I posted this pro-life um, post and then this really pro-abortion lady started laying into me. She just assumed that I was a white American male and I'm not, <laughs> as you can see. Um, and I just responded calmly and lovingly and with reason. And then, well, of course she didn't change her mind, but there were other people watching and they began to see why we are pro-life and like wow. how we love the mother as well as the child. That's the real like way we should go about pro-life things. Wow. Yeah. That, that's amazing that you can reach people through social media and you know the means. Yeah. Yeah, so how, how much time would you spend a day on social media? Oh, I don't really count. It's like really flexible. I just go with the flow, but I'd say maybe six hours. I don't know. Wow. And yeah, that's something I haven't been brought up with, but I think it's a great medium to go to reach the youth, isn't yes. it? And what ministries have you been involved with? Well, God blessed me with a singing voice. And um, so I'm a soprano. And right now I'm in St. Francis Church Choir the youth choir and we've been singing in various places we went to both a catholic and an anglican church in queenscliff the other weekend wow yeah they say that music really reaches people's hearts doesn't yes. it like my atheist friend is coming to mass today because he wants to hear us sing that's fantastic uh -huh. yeah and and what do you think also is um your the ministry that you would like to like is it um what about would you think theater would be something that you would one day be involved with or tv well one one, one of my aunts just suggested i should join a theater group but i i'll see how my time commitments go <laughs> yeah and do you have uh, do you think that youth and young adults what do you think is their problems that they're experiencing being quite close to youth yourself yeah well I know modern society is quite atomized, especially after the Industrial Revolution. We're not really united with the wider extended family anymore, in most cases. Like people are living far flung from their families, like my brother's in Egypt, my parents are in Singapore, I'm over here, and there's no sense of community. And so, and also there's this loss of direction in life. People are just drifting from job to job, from relationship to relationship, and they don't settle down. They always hope that something else will come along that's better but no you where you are is where you're meant to be and you're meant to make that better i see yeah, yeah. and it's interesting what what does that is the word you describe atomize yeah. i haven't heard that yeah yes. like little particles so it's yeah. not the you know how they had the nuclear family oh yeah and then they had the extended family so now it's called the atomized yeah. family i mean just like one individual person all by themselves yes so, you, um, so you're saying create the community in your neighborhood, like yeah, like the friends in uh, that live around you, the church that lives around you. Do you call it the local church? Would you? Is that yes. what you mean by atomize? Well, um, that would be de-atomizing someone, because uh -huh. uh, like atomizing effect of society is when people are just individualistic. They live I for themselves. They mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, they're just cut off from community. I see. Yeah. No, that that is a wonderful thing, and it's great to that you've been involved in Saint Francis Choir and all this. And I suppose that's encouragement. Yeah. To, and what do you think about the drug situation? You know, do you have much of a opinion about the drug situation since you're well, close to the youth? This actually ties in with what I just said because I was reading this article about how they did an experiment experiment on rats uh, with drug laced water and with normal water. And then in the cage where the rats had a really good environment and had a good community, they just drank the normal water. But in the cage where they were isolated and they didn't have anything to stimulate, then they turned to the drug-laced water. Oh, and wow. it's because when we don't have human or social bonds, then drug, drugs are the next best thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's a powerful thing. Because we can't stand on our own. We need something to lean on for support and usually it's community but if you don't have a community you just turn to whatever it's there that might make you feel good for a bit so you have uh, drug addict mice <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that um, yeah i've um, worked with people with with drug problems and i i would you know i think what you're saying is very significant and mm. very powerful yeah and we probably need to go for a break now thank you
You've been watching Spirit of Life. Stay with us and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Spirit of Life. My name is Geraldine Lee, your host, and our guest is Jean Sia. She's been sharing about her faith journey. Welcome back, Jean. You were sharing about how community is very important. Do you have more to say about that? Oh, yes. Um, have you heard of this poet, John Donne? He said this really famous quote that I'm sure everyone knows, no man is an island. And that is part of a poem where he goes on to say, every man is a part of the continent. And as humans, we are social creatures. Like we always need someone else. We are interdependent. We can't stand on our own. And that's how we were made by God. Adam and Eve were made for each other to complement each other because in the image of the likeness of God, they reflect the Holy Trinity, which is a community of persons, a community of love because God is love and love needs a beloved. And so God the Father and the Son love each other and from them proceed the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. And it, it explains about that experience of you, you went to that meeting, there was no one there, and then you met that guy who was an atheist, and then you'll end up being friends. Yeah. Yes, and, and through that whole relationship, you, you bring God's love to them. Mm -hmm. And what other problems do you see youth and young adults having today? Well, there's this really big fear of commitment because people are like, or I can see a problem with that. I don't, I'm not sure if I want to commit to that person or that job or that whatever. And Pope Francis has noted this, especially in his last encyclical, Amoris Laetitia, which is on the family. And it's a really good read. I know it's really long, but if you just break down into chunks, it's awesome. And um, so I was reading recently about how to become holy and mature as a person. You just stick to something. Mm. You make a decision and you stick to it. And it, might go through what seems horrible times and but you'll come out the other side a stronger person yeah mm. but also you have to know when to say no and walk away yeah so now that's wonderful would you say that that is they're talking about youth being the generation y so would you say that would include the generation y yes yeah mm. and but what are some guidelines to young people you know who might be listening to the show to what uh, they would commit themselves to because there's many things to commit yourself yes. to. Yes. Well, everyone has talents. Everyone has some form of intelligence, like there's emotional intelligence, there's intellectual. You just go with what God has given you. Or sometimes you might not. Like, I hated law, but it's become part of my life's journey. Like, sometimes God might stick you in a difficult place. I read about St. Francis and St. Clair about how God makes us holy by making us do the opposite of what we're naturally inclined to as well. Because St. Francis was this really contemplative soul. He actually went off to a cave and wanted to be a hermit. But in the end, he founded the Franciscan order and it's like the first friars. Mm. And then there was St. Clair. She was like really bubbly party girl, but she ended up being a contemplative nun. Ah. Yeah, and would you talk about the commitment? Why are they so fearful of commitment? I don't totally understand that with youth and young adults. Well, I guess we've been conditioned not to have delayed gratification. Like, not everything's instant. There's fast food, there's the internet. You can get everything at the click of a button. You don't want to suffer the pain of like sticking to something and working through the problems. And that's the same in relationships mm, right. as well. People just bail when there's trouble. Yes, how could leaders today or parents help the young people stay with commitment? I guess... Should they preach to them about the importance of commitment or is... Well, model that to them through their lives. I think a lot of youth are broken because their parents themselves have been wounded and maybe there's a broken marriage or... Yeah, and sometimes it's a good thing to walk away from an abusive marriage, but other times you've just got to stick with it and work through it. And then you model to your children how to love the other person even when it's difficult to love. Yeah, that's, that's a great you know, uh, experience because it, there's such a high divorce rate in Australia. I think 1.8, nearly, you know, nearly every uh, two people, you know, one in every two people. Uh, you know, so you can see why 
I can now understand. And sometimes I find it with the ministries I run that it is hard to get voluntary commitment yeah. to, you know, volunteers. Yes. Yes. And I guess people are just a bit more selfish nowadays. <laughs> yeah. And also in it's society, um, in the m like Middle Ages, everyone had their role in society and they knew what was expected of them and there was a certain freedom to that because you didn't have to stress yourself about oh, if I work harder, then I'll get that better job, I'll get that better spouse. But now we put so much pressure on ourselves because it's like all up to us what to make of our lives. Mm. Yes, and how do you see that older uh, Christians can help younger Christians today, young adults today? Well, in my own life, um, like my ex-boss at the office for the Life, Marriage and Family Office of the Archdiocese of Melbourne, um, mm. he has invited me to join his family for dinner and he sees it as an important part of ministry that families include single people in their lives because they enrich and support each other. And also when I was recovering from the really dark period in my life, I took refuge with my friends, the Schaefers, and they're this really beautiful family and just living with them and they didn't really do anything actively, they just let me be. And they also allowed me to do the housework. Wow. Which is really therapeutic and really important because I just spent like three years in my head. And I've read that um, part of, cause we, um, sorry, there's of this- physical bodies? Yeah. I mean, there's this encyclical by a Pope, I think it's, on, oh, it's by John Paul II. Oh, Theology it, of the Body? No, it's on the dignity of the human. Ah. And he talks about how he had to work in the mines when the communists came. And you might think that's a degrading job, but really there's a certain dignity to working with your hands. And it's like, you can't separate like physical work from mental work. That's why in the Benedictine monasteries, they um, have eight hours for study, eight hours for, for work. work. Yeah, and physical work yeah. too. Yeah. No, that, that, that's very inspiring. And you're, you're right that we need to physicalize it. I, uh, there's some research out that when people are depressed, if you get them to touch the, the earth, like, you know, yes. and, and make clay pots or anything, they actually can't really be depressed yeah. because they're actually feeling, you know, um, the connection. Conne connection with the body and the spirit. Oh, I read that and how there's like microorganisms in the earth that like make, inc yeah. make you healthier. That's wonderful what you're sharing. Um, You've been so inspiring during this program, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs> You've been watching Spirit of Life. Goodbye, and God bless you. Have a good week. <laughs>